thank you so much for coming. Is the volume tight? Um, and I want to thank whoever it was that nominated me to give this talk. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what I do. Um, so that's a welcome opportunity. So um, today I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is what is social psychology? So what is it exactly that I do? Um, I, there's often a lot of misperceptions about, um, about that when I tell people that I'm a social psychologist. Um, I also want to talk about the major contributions of the study of social psychology and health and how it's contributed to our understanding of um, health, wellness, medicine, and even medical education. Um, I also want to just give a brief overview about what it is that some of the DMU faculty members are doing that are incorporating, um, incorporating social psychology into their teaching, their service, and their research. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about some of my own research studies. Um, but before I do that, I want you all to meet Dick. Um, this is my uh, father-in-law, Dick, and I have his permission to tell this story. Um, <laughs> but, but Dick is your... Typical all-American, blue-collar guy. He has worked in a meatpacking plant his whole life and, like, honestly loves it. I can't understand that, but he honestly loves his job and takes a lot of pride in it. But he's typical in a lot of other ways. Um, so he lives in a really small town. Um, he enjoys a cold beer from time to time or daily frequently, um, and he's been a lifelong smoker, and he hasn't even considered for more than a millisecond the idea of quitting smoking. Um, if you suggest to him that he ought to quit, sm quit smoking, um, he just sort of discounts you, and there's just, he's not going to have it. Um, so he's just kind of a stubborn, all-American, small-town guy. And so I kind of want you to keep him in mind as I'm talking about some of the theories and concepts that I'm going to review for you today, and then as I start talking about my own research a little bit, we'll come back and we'll revisit Dick. So first I want to give a little introduction to what a social psychologist is. So when I tell people that I'm a social psychologist, they often re react with some sort of like, ooh, are you analyzing me? And I'm not. <laughs> and I'm not even remotely qualified to analyze anybody or provide counseling services of any kind. Um, so what I do is study the process of which individuals are influenced by the real, the imagined, or the implied presence of others. And so I study how individuals are affected by those around them. Health psychology as a field more broadly is devoted to the understanding of the psychological influences on how people stay healthy, how they become ill, the mechanisms that contribute to health and illness, um, and, a broad, and it's just a really broad field. And so my niche of that is taking social psychology and how decisions about health are influenced by the real, the imagined, or the implied presence of others. Um, and it should be noted, of course, that when we're talking about health and wellness, we're really operating under the World Health Organization's definition of health, not just merely the absence of disease, but really a more holistic view of health. So I want to give a brief history about the field of social psychology and health psychology because it's actually a pretty young field. And some of the first beginnings of it happened in the 1950s. Um, in 1958, the United States Public Health Service actually offered free tuberculosis screenings. It was offered by the government. It was a free service to detect tuberculosis, um, and anybody could participate. Unfortunately, nobody participated. The rates were much lower than expected, and people didn't really understand why. So the researchers really wanted to figure out, we're offering this free public health service. This is an important health concern of our time, and people are not participating in this program. Why is that? Um, that same year, um, a physician also was engaging in what we would call social psych research. And this researcher wanted to examine how fear affects the understanding of surgical pre procedures and the physical healing of surgical procedures among his patients. Now, this is really important because it's the first time that we really know of that somebody is taking sort of a fuzzy psychological construct like fear. It's an emotion, um, has cognitions associated with it, but it's just sort of fuzzy psychological construct and really seeing how that is affecting um, physical recovery from an invasive surgical procedure. Um, so that was really the first time we're looking at somebody applying psychology to physical health. In the late 1950s to late 1960s, um, psychologists started really developing theories to contribute to our understanding of health and wellness. 
Um, so the first theory that was developed is the health belief model. Um, and this was sort of developed in response to the tuberculosis screening, um, that the program that was done. So the health belief model states that people will engage in health protective action if they believe that they are susceptible to the illness that you are warning them about, if they believe that they are susceptible, susceptible to that illness, if they believe that that illness is severe enough, so if they think that they are likely to get some horrible disease, they're more likely to participate. And they're also more likely to participate or take this health protective action if they believe that they are able to. So what I want to point out is that the constructs in the model all involve the word perceived. So we're not talking about the actual severity of an illness or the actual likelihood that you're going to contract the illness. So for example, um, people really think that they are very likely to get very rare diseases. And when I think about my own children in my own life, I, I have nightmares about like all the terrible things that could happen to them. And of course, most of those things are really unlikely to happen. I don't really worry about them dying from the flu which really is more likely to happen. So people perceive that rare, severe things are much more likely to happen to them than common things are. And so there's a whole body of literature that looks at people's perceptions of risk, their perceived vulnerability of illnesses, and sort of the disconnect between that and the objective risk um, that they might encounter. So I want to come back to this again later. Um, but this is a really um, one of the first theories that was developed. It talks about perceptions that subjective perception over objective reality and how that's contributing to health behaviors. So then, in the 1970s, there were some, we continued to sort of evolve as a field. And it was when we, graduate programs in psychology started offering degrees um, with an emphasis in health. It was also when we had the first book sort of, sort of outlining our field. And Health Psychology was published in 1979, and that was really the first time that a book was published in our area of study. <laughs> The biopsychosocial model was also introduced in the 1970s, and it was introduced by actually a psychiatrist. So again, this is somebody who has sort of an orientation in medicine, but is also considering mental health. And they introduced the biopsychosocial model. And this model sort of views biological factors, psychological factors, and sociological factors as sort of intertwined systems, much as you would think of systems of the body. Um, and so this was sort of really a development and coincided with the shift in how people were thinking about treating medicine more from a disease focus to health wellness and health promotion focus. Um, and so these are all some of the advances that really laid the foundation for the field of study that I'm in now. So what I really want to spend more time on is talking about the main contributions that this area of study has given us the ways in which the study of social psychology of health has really contributed to our understanding of health and medicine. So the first area that I'm going to talk about is really looking at people's health behaviors, their attitudes towards health, their beliefs, their emotions related to health. Um, and that's where a lot of research has really focused. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time there. Stress and coping, how people deal with stress, how they experience stress has been a really large area of study also. And finally, talk a little bit about um, the study of social support and how that affects health. So of course, this is sort of a picture of all of the big behaviors, right? We'd all live a lot longer if we would sleep eight hours every night, exercise 30 minutes three times a week, eat five servings of fruits and vegetables, don't smoke, don't drink too much, and somehow manage to be a productive, happy human being in there all at the same time. We, of course, know that people don't really do these things. A very very small fraction of the population is actually able to engage in all of these behaviors consistently. And if you've ever tried to modify even one of these behaviors, then you understand why this is so challenging. So take, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. The first one is that most of these habits are formed pretty early in life. So there's a new study out that shows that um, children's preferences for food are actually influenced by what they're exposed to in utero. So these are influences that are taking shape before this person is even really a person, and it's influencing their preferences for food throughout their lifespan. So these, these preference are, preferences are developed and established early on, and at a time when children really have very little control over their environments. They're not really in control of the kinds of foods that they are served at their home, at their school, what's available at the supermarket. Um, so these are formed really early in life. This also coincides 
with a time where they have little incentive to change. I mean, most teenagers are involved in sports or they're doing things, they have a high metabolism just because they're young, so they're eating junk food all the time. And for most of them, there's not a really serious consequence associated with that. Not promoting eating junk food or saying that healthy eating isn't, a ha isn't important, but they can get away with a lot more that than you can as you get older. And the chronic diseases that are likely to plague them don't onset for many decades. And you can't get children to think about the consequences of the next day, let alone what could happen to them 30 years from now. So it's really hard to modify these behaviors that are ingrained and established so early. The other interesting thing is that the relation among health habits is, is only moderate. Somebody who follows a strict vegan diet may also be a smoker. It's probably unlikely, but it could happen. And somebody who exercises five times a day might not wear their seatbelt or might not put on sunscreen. So we can't really use a one-size-fits-all approach to encouraging and promoting health. There's just each behavior is kind of unique. And finally, the reinforcements of these behaviors change throughout the lifespan. So my father-in-law, Dick, who started smoking when he was probably a teenager, likely started smoking because of factors like peer pressure. And it was offered to him, or it was convenient, or his parents smoked, and that's how he got started. He's probably not smoking still because his friends think it's cool. He's probably smoking now because he's psychologically and physically addicted to it. So the things that might be important for modifying a health behavior at one stage in life may not apply at another stage in life. And so these things all make modifying health behaviors very difficult. There have been advances in theory, and our understanding of people's attitudes and beliefs has also evolved. And the health belief model itself has continued to evolve. It's been the foundation of other broader theories, um, and constructs have been added to the health belief model over time. And so we really have experienced developments in the theory over time. A lot of research is really focused on people's attitudes. Again, attitudes are very highly correlated with behavior, but not as high as you would think. When I'm teaching these constructs in class, I ask students, you know, how many of you think recycling is important? Well, how many of you recycle? How many of you think that NPR is a valuable resource? Well, how many of you donate to NPR? So it's really easy to sort of point out the discrepancy between people's attitudes and beliefs and their actual behavior. So when we're talking about producing effective health communication and trying to modify people's health habits, the literature is sort of focused on three areas. The first is who is communicating? So in order to have effective attitude changes in whoever you're delivering your health messages to, it's important that the person who delivers those messages, A, be perceived as an expert, and B, also be perceived as somebody who's trustworthy and likable, um, and somebody who is similar to them. So if we think about that in terms of the way health information is disseminated, particularly to patients, it's really hard to find somebody who fits all of those criteria. Um, and people have, there are, there are a lot of studies that show that people have real questions about the trustworthy of their healthcare providers. But finding a doctor who is similar to me, if I'm a single mom, low income, living in a rough neighborhood, that's going to be really hard to do. So that's something to consider as we look at how we talk to potential patients and how we educate our medical students. The content is also, of course, really important. And you can produce really drastic changes in attitudes by spouting really extreme um, beliefs and being really vocal about your beliefs. And you can produce attitude changes that way. But they're not long-lasting. And what, of course, we really want is to produce attitude shifts that lead to long-term behavior changes. And so to do that, you really need to have concise, clear, short health messages. Um, and again, that's sometimes hard to do because you're often talking about very complicated things. Message framing is also really important, and I'm going to come back to this later, which is why I'm introducing it now. But the way that you provide or package that information is almost more important than the information itself. So the way that you talk to somebody about the information, you can present the same information, but doing it in one of two ways. So you can sort of highlight the benefits of engaging in a health behavior, or you can highlight the potential losses of not engaging in that health behavior. Those two ways of providing essentially the same factual information will have a large influence on whether or not that person will then have um, produced this behavior change that you're interested in. So I'm going to come back to that again a little bit later. But the way you package your information is almost just as important as the information itself. So 
The other area that has really been kind of the hallmark of social health psychology is looking at stress and coping. And there are lots of reasons for this, but the main reason is that people report that their lives are stressful. Um, the subjective perception of people is that overall their lives are very stressful. And then there's been some research lately too that has suggested that this perceived high level of stress is being seen among even young children, that they also perceive their life to be very stressful. It's also interesting because there's a great deal of variability in how people individually respond to stress. So of course, giving a talk to my colleagues and my supervisors is a stressful event, but it's not debilitating for me, and theoretically it should provide somewhat of a sort of performance enhancement, and some people thrive off of that stress. But public speaking is like the number one fear that people have when they talk about phobias. For, so for other people, the idea of getting up and giving a talk would be absolutely debilitating. Um, and there's just a lot of individual variability in how people would respond to a stressful event. Um, and so that, looking at negative affectivity, chronic stress, that has really received a lot of attention in the literature. But what is important is the subjective appraisal of stress. Because we know that stress is a negative emotion with sort of set um, bio, biophysical reactions in the body and negative emotions attached to it. We know how people perceive, how people experience the stress, but we have to think about who is most likely to experience that stress when it comes to healthcare. So think about medical patients who have little control over what's happening to them, people who are otherwise disabled, the young or the elderly, who are coming into a healthcare situation and that can be very stressful and scary. And the reason that people perceive this stuff to be so stressful is oftentimes because they have a lack of control over the situation. They perceive these events to be very stressful because they have little control over what's about to happen to them. So this is something that's really important when we talk about patient-provider communication and health literacy. And as we educate our students on how to deliver health messages, thinking about stress and how you can help patients um, and populations experience less stress is really important. Social support is the perception, this is the third area that social psychology has really spent a lot of um, attention on. Um, social support, this is the idea that we are valued, cared for, esteemed individuals who are connected to a social network. Um, and I don't necessarily mean Facebook, I mean like real social networks. Um, there are different kinds of social support, and, and there's a lot of research on all of these areas. But the first is informational support. So informational support is just, if I am newly diagnosed with breast cancer, that I have somebody that I can go to and get accurate information from. That there is somebody out there who can provide me with the kinds of information that I need when I need it, um, and in a way that I can understand it. And there's been a lot of research looking at informational support because, um, so for example, there's research that includes newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. And so organizations have started to form social networks of breast cancer, oops, of newly diagnosed breast cancer patients because they connect with one another and are able to provide each other with non-medical jargon information that, is, that helps them to reduce their stress. And by being a part of these networks, they actually deal with the illness more effectively. This isn't just some, I perceive that I'm doing better with life. It's, I, have, I am now perceiving that I'm a member of a social network, I'm receiving the support, and therefore, I'm actually living longer. So objective health indicators suggest that this effect is very strong, um, and it's very real. Instrumental support is the perception that there's somebody out there who could give me a ride to the doctor if I needed it. Is there somebody out there who could lend me money or drive me to my doctor's appointment or whatever? It's actually providing tangible support in those sort of real life, day to day kind of ways. Instrumental or an emotional support, of course, is this perception that um, I can experience warmth and nurturance from another human being. Um, now, again, I want to point out that none of this is objective. This is my perception. If I perceive that I can call my neighbor Joe and ask him to drive me to the doctor, that's enough. 
Neighbor Joe doesn't actually have to drive me to the doctor, and Neighbor Joe doesn't actually have to even be willing to drive me to the doctor. But if I perceive that he would be willing to drive me to the doctor if I ask, then I'm going to feel like I have that social support, and that is what is important. So there's literally thousands of articles on social support and health, and it's really fascinating to read. Um, one of the landmark studies that was done included over 7,000 California residents um, and a, across a nine-year span. And the researchers took lots of measures, but they measured social integration and the number of social contacts that the individuals had. Then they also measured indicators of morbidity and mortality um, and used that as their dependent variables. And what they found is that, on average, those individuals who maintained or increased their social connections and their social integration lived longer. They actually, on average, lived two and a half years longer than those people who were socially isolated. And we know that people, you know, as people age, some have a tendency to become socially isolated, and that's really bad for health. And this is one of the first studies that really showed why. If you don't feel that social support, that value, that nurturance, then you literally live a shorter life on average. So this slide is a shameless plug. Like, it's just an opportunity for me to show pictures of my children, and I'm just not above that. Um, but there is a real, actual, legitimate reason for showing this slide. So remember I said it's the perception of social support that matters. You don't actually have to be experiencing it. I just have to perceive that it would be available to, available to me if I wanted it. And so there's been some interesting sort of fun research that's shown that that social support can come from a variety of sources, including pets. So when people experience stress, they experience a pretty predictable set of cardiovascular and sympathetic nervous system reactions. All those sort of physical indicators of stress. When we interact with a pet, so if we go home and we pet our cat, or we play with our dog, we actually experience less stress. All those physical indicators of stress decrease. The fascinating part is that the animals also experience that decrease in stress levels. So the take home message today is to go home and pet your dog. Um, and this, of course, is only going to fuel fire to an endless debate, but there's actually been studies to show that dogs are better than cats. I know, I know. <laughs> So if, although if you hate dogs, I suppose that's not true for you. But in general, dogs are more effective at producing this reduction in stress than cats so are. They're <laughs> so neat. Yes. Um, so I kind of wanted to shift gears now on that and just talk a little bit about how um, you know, social psychology is a relatively young field. Um, you know, it's really only been established since the 1970s, 1980s. Um, but I think we've made significant contributions to our understanding of health and wellness. Um, this slide here is a quote from Robert Kaplan, who's the director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research at the National Institutes of Health. And he states that with the explosion of diverse scientific methodolo methodologies being used to address our most critical public health issues, it is an opportune time for NIH to provide best practices. NIH has really stepped up and has formed the Office of Behavioral and Social, Sci um, social Science Research, which is broader than just social psychology, but it includes social science researchers from a variety of disciplines. And what they're doing is they're really promoting interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research. So now when we're doing things like studying the progression of an illness or disease, we're not just looking at the biological manifestations of that disease. We're really wanting to promote the ways in which social science can contribute. Um, and so I think the office of, that office has done a really good job in the fact that there is sort of a federal office whose sole purpose to be the promotion of behavioral and social science research is really important. In 2004, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on ways of improving medical education. So we know that uh, about half of all cause mortality is, can, be, can, can, be, can be linked back to choices and personal, personal choices in behavior. So health be individuals' health behavior is having a large impact on all-cause mortality. And so the Institute of Medicine issued this report on ways that we could improve medical education because it was sort of recognized that medical students receive a lot of training on anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, all of the things that you know, they really need to know. But they're not really receiving any training on these areas. 
So mind-body interactions. That's really relating back to the Janus study that I mentioned, making that link between the psychological experience of fear and physical healing. Those mind-body interactions, you know, would have been perceived as sort of a fluffy, non-science, pseudoscience sort of endeavor. But now it's really being incorporated into um, the medical curricula at a lot of universities. Looking at patient behavior, factors that influence um, compliance with recommendations and prescription use and proper use of prescriptions, just a variety of issues. Um, looking at physician roles and behaviors, the way that physicians communicate information to their patients, the way that patients perceive that communication. Um, looking at social and cultural influences, um, so we can't, like I said before, we can't use just a one-size-fits-all way of promoting a health message because different social and cultural groups will perceive that message differently and will receive it differently. And finally, looking at health policy and economics as an important contribution to our understanding. So I, of course, wanted to highlight the department that I'm in and highlight a little bit of what they're doing. So my um, boss, Mary Minzer Hansen, has been involved with the Institute of Medicine in her own report looking at, the, looking at public health law, policy, and economics, and how the challenges and opportunities as we sort of move forward looking at healthcare in the future. And so she's really using social and behavioral science in her service, even though she's not trained as a social psychologist, whether she intends to or not, this is becoming a part of her service work. Um, and I also wanted to highlight Dr. Beverly, who happens to be in the audience. And she does work looking at poverty and how that influences health, health literacy, patient-provider interactions. And not just looking at those constructs alone, but also looking at how that affects both the quality of care and the cost of care. So again, Dr. Beverly was trained as a physician. She wasn't trained as a social psychologist. Intentionally or not, she's doing social psychology work now. Um, and so it is kind of prevalent, whether you intend it to be or not. So now I want to give a, kind of a brief overview of the three areas of research that I spend most of my time in. The first is um, a multi-ecological level childhood obesity prevention program. Um, this is something that I've been involved in for a few years, um, and it's pretty neat, so I'm going to talk a little bit about it today. Um, talking about my research looking at the social and cultural factors affecting HPV vaccine uptake. Um, if you've ever heard me talk before, you've probably heard me talk about that. So I'm going to give a brief overview of that section. And then I'm going to talk about some new research I'm doing looking at message framing and information avoidance with respect to skin cancer. So, um, you know, I've been doing research for about 10 years, um, and I've gotten to do a lot of really fun stuff. So I, I studied in undergrad um, the spatial memory development of children. It's super boring. Nobody cares about that. Um, but I got to be involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I've got to do other really fun stuff, like looking at video game violence affecting aggression in children. Um, so I've got to do a lot of really fun stuff. But these are the three areas that I've sort of um, carved my path in currently. And, you know, it might evolve, but I'm pretty excited about these things, so I'm going to focus on them. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a multi-ecological childhood obesity prevention program that I got to be a part of. Um, the model up there is Bronfenbrenner's social ecological model. And it's very much similar to the biopsychosocial model that I presented earlier. This model looks at an individual's behavior, in this case we're talking about young children, and doesn't just look at that individual in and of itself. So we're sort of beyond the point where I'm going to deliver a health intervention to you. I'm going to try to convince you to do what I say you should do. We're looking broader because now we recognize that that individual's behavior could be affected by everything from genetics all the way up to health policy and law. That child that we're talking about for this particular study is influenced by their parents, their school, their community, and their state, really. And so in order to develop effective health promotion programs, we can't just focus on the individual. We really have to recognize that if we're going to make changes, we have to make changes at multiple levels. So this study was a health intervention, um, a, a promotion program that was done in Iowa and in, in Minnesota. Um, this was an experiment, so participants were randomly assigned to either the treatment or the control condition. Um, children from commu um, two communities in Iowa and two communities in Minnesota were first matched on sociodemographic factors such as percent poverty, percent free reduced lunch, um, racial, ethnic makeup, that sort of thing. Then they were randomly assigned 
to the experiment or the tr um, control condition. And what we did is we really developed a whole program with three specific goals. The first goal was to really encourage children to engage in 60 more, 60 minutes or more of physical activity every day. Not at once, we're not asking them to run six miles, we're just asking them throughout the day, try to accumulate 60 minutes of physical activity. Gave them pedometers to wear, which they were really bad at wearing. Um, we did a whole bunch of things to try to track their physical activity and encourage it. We also wanted them to eat five or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day. That actually turned out to be one of the easier ones. But the unique part of this study was that we asked them to reduce their screen time. This is the first study that we were aware of that really specifically addressed screen time. It's not uncommon to look at averages in these studies and see an average screen time usage by children of up to 40 hours a week. That's more than a lot of people work in a week. And they're spending that amount of time in front of the TV, in front of a video game console, in front of their computer or their iPod. Um, and so we really wanted to reduce the amount of screen time they're consuming because there's been associations with screen time and obesity. So we did several things. We did this study at multiple levels. So the first thing we did was at the community level. We engaged um, the community in community-wide kickoff events, celebrations, really getting people rallied about the, the project, getting them engaged in um, this new healthy, these healthy messages that we were trying to sort of get at them. Um, we did a lot of newspaper, TV advertising. There were billboards throughout the community to promote the SWITCH program. Um, and we had SWITCH days, community activities that were geared to get everybody from the community to come and really learn about healthy cooking, physical activity, but do it in a fun way and in a way in which community members as a whole could come and participate and benefit from. We also had a school component and a family component. Now, most of the research that's been done in preventing or treating childhood obesity has really focused on either the family, the individual, or the school. And we know that there are some really good things happening in those areas, but they're really not that effective. I mean, the current obesity rates really speak to that. So we tried to hit at all of these levels. And at the school component, we had the kickoff event, we had celebrations, and every month throughout the study, teachers were sent a packet of materials that they could use in their classroom, sort of stuff for the bulletin boards, assignments, games, those sorts of things that the teachers could integrate into the curricula. And at the family level, we included monthly calendars, tracking sheets, recipe ideas, family activities for physical activity. So go out with your family and see who can you know, develop a scavenger hunt for your family, things like that. Things that were supposed to get kids out of the, in front of the TV and increase their physical activity and do it in a way that was fun. And so this study, um, we collected that data at baseline in the middle of the study, at the end of the study, and again at the six month follow up. And what we found is that we had pretty good success. Um, we, re we got reports from teachers, parents, and children of the key behaviors that we were interested in. And what we found is that at the six month mark, we saw reductions in screen time, we saw increases in fruits and vegetable um, consumption, and we saw sort of a moderate increase in physical activity, but again, we had a really hard time measuring physical activity from kids. But what we found is that six months later, some of those effects in, the, in sort of our expected directions were actually stronger. So even though we didn't get a significant effect in every measure that we included, the ones that we did seem to really take hold. Um, so this was really encouraging. Um, it's a fun project. It's still actually being implemented. The SWITCH program is being implemented, I think, in some Des Moines area schools. Sort of a fun motto of switch what you do, switch what you do, and switch what you do. Um, and so that was a really fun research project, very public health oriented, um, and hopefully really hitting on some areas of success. Next, I want to highlight some of the um, research that I've been doing looking at social and cultural factors um, that influence HPV vaccine uptake. So um, I was a graduate student at Iowa State in 2006 when the HPV vaccine received FDA approval and recommendation. the recommendations were released for girls as young as nine to start receiving the vaccine and for women who were up to age 26 to get caught up on the HPV vaccine. And so there had been a lot of research looking at physician attitudes towards the HPV vaccine, parents' attitudes towards the HPV vaccine, and even young women's attitudes towards the HPV vaccine, and whether or not they intended to get the HPV vaccine. So we're asking them, hypothetically, if this were available to you, would you get it? So that's all valuable, and that's you know a good base from which to start. 
But there was no research really looking at what factors really impact whether or not people actually get the HPV vaccine. So this was really um, the, the establishment of sort of the research questions in the study got its base in the health belief model. So their perceived vulnerability, perceived severity, the perceived effectiveness of the vaccine. Those are all important constructs that we included in the research. But we also included some things about mother-daughter communication. So whether or not young girls, these are college freshmen and sophomore, report that they talked with their mothers as adolescents. So this is sort of a retrospective report. Did you talk with your mother about issues related to sex, puberty, development, STDs, the HPV, HPV and the HPV vaccine? Questions like that. And we sort of divided those constructs up into two subconstructs. Communication about sex and then communication about sex related to moral, religious, and cultural values. Um, because they sort of showed that they were sort of two distinct constructs. Some women reported that they talked to their mom a great deal about issues of STDs, condoms, and that sort of thing, but didn't so much talk about issues of um, moral, cultural, and religious values, whereas other people reported that I received a lot of lecturing about the cultural values and religious values and why I should wait till I'm married to have sex, but my mom never really told me about condoms. So we had to split those two because they showed that they were sort of distinct constructs. And so we were really interested in, do these health belief model constructs, in addition to this idea of mother-daughter communication, do those things influence whether or not women are getting this new vaccine? So we included um, a cross-sectional survey study of over 900 Iowa State undergraduates. Um, they were sort of a captive audience. They were first year, second year introductory psychology students who have to do research for participation and so on. And so they participated in our study. It wasn't a long one. Um, and we found that not, not as expected, perceived vulnerability did affect whether or not they got the HPV vaccine. So those young women who felt that they were at risk of getting HPV were more likely to have received the vaccine. And in fact, those women who had the riskiest previous sexual behaviors perceived that they were at greater risk and were more likely to get the vaccine. So it's actually people who are engaging in the riskiest amount of behavior were more likely to then take this protective action. But what we also found is that mother-daughter communication about sex was also important for whether or not these women got the vaccine. So this is really important because we're looking at adult women. They are not legally obliged to get consent from their parents about this, but their reports of the amount of communication they had with their mothers as adolescents is predicting whether or not they get this new vaccine. Um, and so it shows that you can't just look at perceived vulnerability to an illness and determine whether or not you can get people to get the vaccine. Factors like this are really important. So as I was sort of writing the lit review, which you're supposed to do before you do the research, but of course I didn't, and I'm doing all my lit searching and doing the lit review for this project and looking at stats on incidents and morbidity and mortality, I'm finding that there's a disparity between whites and other racial ethnic groups. Latinas and African Americans were much more likely to die from cervical cancer, much more likely to get cervical cancer, but very little research on why that might be. Um, so I started to look at, well, is there maybe social cultural factors that are influencing whether or not these young women would then get the vaccine? Are there disparities in vaccine uptake? So I used the health belief model as, again, the foundation for this study. Um, I included perceptions of severity, perceptions of um, likelihood of getting the disease, and so on. And I also included things like mother-daughter communication because it was successful in the last study, so I was obviously going to include it in the subsequent study. But I also included other measures that are not normally found in vaccine research. So the health belief model has actually been really effective at predicting who will get vaccines. The flu shot, hepatitis B, those sorts of things. The, the health belief model has been used extensively and has been very effective in sort of predicting who is likely to get that and who is not. But things that might be culture specific were not included. So when I'm thinking about Latina culture, I'm thinking a lot about um, sort of cultural norms and how deeply ingrained those things are. I'm also thinking about things like religiosity. These are not theoretical constructs that have been included in previous research, um, and I couldn't find them anywhere. So I decided to include them in my survey study that I did here at DMU. I collected the data um, from over 300 participants. I can't say I have to say. My research assistants collected data from over 300 participants at clinics around Des Moines, um, at um, the Mercy Family Practice Clinic, 
and also at the primary health care clinics where they serve sort of a large um, uninsured or underinsured population. And so we collected this cross-sectional survey data, asked these individuals lots of questions. Um, and the important thing that I want to highlight in this slide is, is not, you know, the statistics of it all. But on the left-hand side is the probability of receiving the vaccine. And the, I have to make sure I say this right, the Latinas are in the green color and the whites are in the white color on the grass. And you can see that these constructs that are not normally included in our standard theories are really having interesting effects. So, for example, perceptions of communication about values, which is on the lower right-hand side. Um, the white women who say that they spent a lot of time as adolescents communicating with their mothers about issues related to sex um, and values, those women were a lot more likely to have received the HPV vaccine. However, Latina women who say that they communicated a lot with their mothers are much less likely to have received the HPV vaccine. So this just highlights, again, that we can't disseminate one-size-fits-all health promotion messages because there are clearly cultural differences that affect how those messages are received um, and whether or not people want to receive the vaccine will be related to how those messages are received. And maybe there are more deep cultural things that we could look at that might help us in our efforts to promote health. So the third study that I'm doing in this area is um, sort of overcoming the flaws of the previous two studies, and that those were both cross-sectional survey studies. And of course, we can't really determine causality from that. We need to look longitudinally what the um, relations look like. So this is a study of over 900 African-American families. It's a really large study. It's much broader than my little piece of it. Um, but what we looked at is over time, how does mother-daughter communication affect HPV vaccine uptake of young African-American girls in this case? So time one data was collected in 1997 and 1998. All the participants were 12 to 13 years of age. And those participants are actually still being followed today. I think data collection for wave six was just completed, and they're now collecting genetics data and all kinds, you know, relationship partners, all kinds of really fun stuff from these participants. But we stopped at the 2008-2009 data collection. These young women were about 22, 23 years of age um, at that time. And so we looked at mother-daughter communication reported over time in those earlier years, and then looked at HPV vaccine uptake at time five, whether, they, whether or not they had received it. And we also looked at whether or not this was moderated by sort of a very important factor, socioeconomic status. And so several things came up from this study. One is that mother-daughter communication, or actually parent-child communication, about sex and issues related to sexuality, they decrease over time, which is actually really interesting in its own right. As your children age and they go through adolescence, theoretically you should be talking to them about these issues more frequently. But pretty much everybody showed a decline in the um, prevalence of mother-daughter communication about sex. Those who decreased their communication levels the least were the most likely to have received the HPV vaccine. But what we found is that this was moderated by socioeconomic status. And, and even still, we don't really have a very clear explanation of why this might be. But you can see that for those women who were engaging in high levels of parent-child communication as represented on the bottom bar, those who were of high socioeconomic status were most likely to receive the HPV vaccine. But those who were of low levels of socioeconomic status, the level of mother-daughter communication really had very little impact on whether or not they received that vaccine. So what we can see is that mother-daughter communication over time is clearly an important factor in whether or not these women who are at the greatest risk for cervical cancer are getting the HPV vaccine. And we can also see that some very real sort of social factors such as socioeconomic status are influencing those decisions as well, moderating those effects. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in just a couple minutes is sort of the newest area of research that I've been getting into and that I'm really excited about because I peeked at the data and I think it's working. <laughs> so um, this is going to relate back to my father-in-law, Dick, that I introduced you all to in the beginning, um, but also related to sort of a variety of disparate areas of research. So there isn't a coherent area of research in this yet, um, but there has been mentioned in lots of different articles that people t there's this habit of people to avoid personally relevant health risk information. So my father-in-law, Dick, 
refuses to go to the doctor when we're all thinking that he probably has throat cancer. Refuses to go. Women who have family histories of breast cancer, if they're offered the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic tests for free, 40-50% of them say no thanks. So there's, in various bodies of literature, notes that people don't want to go to the doctor. And in fact, in one of my own research studies looking at um, perceptions of smoking and lung cancer, African American participants were far more likely than the white participants to say that they intentionally avoid going to the doctor because they're afraid they have lung cancer. So they suspect that there's something wrong, but they are intentionally avoiding personally relevant health risk information. And, and in addition, I, um, the, the content on message framing is also important because we know that if I explain, theoretically, if I explain to my father-in-law all of the things he stands to lose by not going and getting this test done, that should be more effective in getting him to go to the doctor than if I told him all the benefits of going to the doctor. Alternatively, if I try to convince somebody to exercise and I tell them all the benefits of engaging in this health promotion sort of preventive action, I'm going to be a lot more successful in changing their behavior than if I tell them all the things they stand to lose by not going. And so we sort of call this the gain frame and the loss frame. Highlighting what people stand to gain, highlighting what people stand to lose influences whether or not they get engage in health prevention or detection behaviors. And, and um, so there's sort of a lot of research on that area. So what I was interested in doing um, is sort of combining my interest in information avoidance, trying to figure out, like, why won't these people go to the doctor? Why won't they find out this information? Combined with my research assistant's interest in skin cancer. She has a passion for skin cancer. Somebody wants to go get a PhD in health psychology herself. And so we decided to combine forces and really look at, well, does information avoidance, is it moderated by how people receive health information? So we designed an experiment that we're um, conducting in the clinic right now, we've collected about data from about 100 people. And what we're doing is presenting participants with information about skin cancer sort of generally, but we're, we're framing that information in one of two ways. In one condition, we're telling people all of the benefits of getting a UV photograph done. If you get this UV photograph done, you can see the, skin, the underlying skin damage that you might have. In the lost frame condition, we're telling participants here are the potential costs for not getting a UV photograph taken and not getting a better idea about your underlying skin damage. And so we're, we're presenting the same information essentially about skin damage and all we're really doing is saying, hey, there's this thing called a UV photograph that you can get and it sort of shows underlying skin damage that's not visible to the naked eye and it could indicate sort of your overall skin damage and risk for skin cancer. We're not really going even much more um, beyond that. And all I can say is I peeked at the data and it looks sort of good and that the people who are receiving information about all of the things that they stand to gain are showing higher levels of information avoidance. They do not want to see their picture. In fact, overall, people do not want to see their picture. So they fill out the survey data, they sort of talk to my RA and they're just like, is that available to me? And we have to say, well, not here, not really. Um, and then they say, good, I don't want to know. And, and, and so not only is it showing up in the data that I'm collecting, but it's also showing up in just sort of people's reports about, oh, God, I would never want to see that. So overall, there's been a lot of developments in our understanding of health and wellness. I think social psychology, although it's a pretty young field, has done a lot to contribute to our understanding. Um, and if we could just convince people, find ways to get people to engage in healthy behaviors, we'd be so much better off. I, for one, can't convince my mom to buy low-fat yogurt, and I can't convince Dick to go to the doctor to get his throat checked out. So we obviously have a ways to go. But the important thing is, is that we all, as health sort of professional educators, and our students as health professionals, whether intentionally or unintentionally, are going to be doing social psychology in their healthcare delivery. Thank you. I'll take any questions if there are any. Rich. In the, on your, your most recent research, in terms of avoidance, what, what are, relatively speaking, the, the data saying? Is it 
fundamentally and prevailing one way versus another would be kind of like 60-40. In terms of my study and the conditions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or don't you have enough data? Well, I ran the stats. I don't have enough data to do that, but I ran them anyway. Um, <laughs> there are... There are, I have three primary measures of information avoidance. My plan is to sort of combine them and make an index and just use them all. Um, so I sort of ask, I do what psychologists do, I ask the same question in three different ways. Um, for one of the measures, P less than 0.05, it's statistically significant with only like 35 people when I did that analysis. The other two were in the expected direction, but P less than 0.10. So there's clearly something happening there. Um, my luck is that now I'm going to collect more data and that the effects are going to disappear, but I hope that it kind of keeps going in that direction because, um, you know, it's just really interesting. I mean, there are so many ways that we can find out about our health and our risk for disease, and it's not even that people just aren't doing it. It's that they are intentionally avoiding it, which is sort of fundamentally different. Um, so finding out what factors can reduce that information avoidance is really the ultimate goal. And then understanding why people do it. You know, so people avoid going to the doctor because they're afraid they might have cancer. So that's a very emotional reason. The other reason, they might just decide, I don't want to go because this is, if I find out this information, if I find out that I have a lot of damage from the sun, this is sort of going to indicate that I need to wear sunscreen more. Wearing sunscreen is a pain and I don't want to do that. Therefore, if I don't go to the doctor and I never find out, then I don't have to change my behavior. So there are a variety of reasons why people might engage in that, but there's really only one research article on this. Um, and I checked with the person who's doing that research and um, just sort of made sure. <laughs> the funny part is, when I first designed the study, I didn't have the message framing manipulation in there. And I thought, you know, this sounds a lot like what so-and-so um, at Florida is doing. I should call and just make sure that they're not already doing it. No, they were already doing my study. Like, they had already designed it and was actually collaborating with one of my colleagues. So we had to change it, and now we have this offshoot, and I think it's going to be productive. Okay. Can you I haven't done anything with that yet, but obviously there are very practical barriers for why people might choose to not um, pursue health care. That's a slightly different issue, though, find, you know, not having the resources to deal with it once I've been diagnosed with an issue. Even just the like, just that perception that they don't have the Right. If I found out something bad, I couldn't deal with it anyway. Um, I haven't really pursued that, but I have it as a measure in my survey. So it's something that usually what... What we do, me and my colleagues, that's usually treated as sort of a nuisance variable. Like, I just control for that. Like, I don't really want to know about that. I want to know about these psycho, psychological factors. Um, but we're sort of realizing that that's a really important, real reason why people do or do not engage in particular health behaviors. So I have it in this study. I haven't looked at it yet. I personally haven't done that research. Um, that's actually really hard to do because it's hard to measure objective social support. You can do lots of things. How many people do I know? Um, that sort of tells you how many people I know, the number of social contacts that I have. Um, but I might be that person who has 5,000 Facebook friends, but I sit at home in my basement all the time by myself. So. Teasing apart those two things is actually really hard. But I will say that the research that's been done that has tried to take more objective measures of that, um, what they do is they say, okay, you list your primary social support system, then they go check with those other people. You need to get permission to do that, but then they go find those people that were listed as social support contacts and then sort of validate their reference that way. Um, and the correlation is high. Usually people aren't terribly inaccurate in perceiving who that they who they could get support from. Um, so yeah. that, that research is very tough because in point of fact if you report 
and go in to contact family members and say, would you support your aunt, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. They say, yes, we would. That doesn't mean they really will. Right, right. So and the aunt may know, in fact, that what they say and what they do is two different things. Right. So it's a, it's a weird. Well, I think my curiosity was more like, Yeah. Like, you know, I'm just curious. Yeah. Just that's okay. No, I think that, and then what I would point out sort of as a counterpoint to that is I don't really think that's social support. That is, I mean, that's services that are available, but that's not, I can call my aunt and she can give me these services. So um, there are, again, there are discrepancies. I mean, there's a, there are so many services available to people, and most people don't know about them. That's sort of outside of the realm of what I was talking about there, but it's probably all intertwined. Nathan. So we're talking about message driven, and I think what we decided was that um, actions that are based on preventing bad things from happening are best framed in danger. Right. Whereas things that are protecting bad things from going on are best framed in law. Yeah, that's actually, I found, really tricky to do because most things that you experience in the healthcare system are clearly detection-oriented or prevention or treatment, which is, which is a whole other area. Um, so we sort of threw around ideas, well, could we talk about the UV photo in terms of prevention or detection? Um, and it was really tough to just sort of, what we did as a result of that is just provided factual information about it and sort of what it does in skin cancer in general. Because as soon as you start trying to manipulate whether you frame it as prevention or detection in terms of what the participant hears, it gets really tricky. Because it's really hard to say, you should get this UV photograph taken without saying, so that you can then do this X, Y, or Z, or so that you will then know to wear sunscreen every day. So it's really hard not to take it to that next step. So we had to sort of take one step back to where, like in a normal conversation, what you would say about it and present very structured information on just what the UV photograph is, what you stand to lose or gain by getting it, and not talking about detection or prevention really explicitly. Um, but that was something we kind of threw around in the planning phases. But other than that, nobody that I know of has done anything with it. All right, if there's no other questions, thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it. It's a late hour. <laughs>